Welcome to the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau's public meeting of its Consumer Advisory Board at the CFPB's headquarters in Washington, D.C. The Consumer Financial Protection Bureau is an independent federal agency whose mission is to help consumer finance markets work by making rules more effective, by consistently and fairly enforcing those rules, and by empowering consumers to take more control over their economic lives. My name is Zixta Martinez. I'm the Associate Director for the External Affairs Division at the CFPB. This is the Consumer Advisory Board's first public meeting of the year. It is being recorded and will be available at consumerfinance.gov. You can also follow CFPB on Facebook and Twitter. Let me spend a few minutes telling you about what you can expect at today's meeting. First, I'll introduce the Bureau's CAB members. Then the CFPB's director, Richard Cordray, will provide opening remarks. Following the director's remarks, Chris D'Angelo, the Bureau's chief of staff, will engage the CAB in a discussion about the CFPB's policy priorities. After that discussion, the meeting will adjourn at approximately 11.30 a.m. and resume at 2 p.m. The CAB's chair, Bill Bynum, will resume the meeting at 2 p.m. He will introduce Yannicka Radcliffe and Genevieve Melford, staff in the Bureau's Office of Financial Education. The two will lead a discussion about measuring financial well-being and highlight the work that the Bureau has done to date on this issue. The meeting will then adjourn at approximately 3.30 p.m. As many of you know, the Dodd-Frank Wall Street Reform and Consumer Protection Act, which created the CFPB, also provided for the establishment of the CFPB's Consumer Advisory Board to advise and consult with the CFPB in the exercise of its functions and to provide information on emerging practices in the consumer financial products or services industry, including regional trends, concerns, and other relevant information. Today's meeting and discussion is in support of this important statutory responsibility. As a reminder, the views of the CAB are their views. They're greatly appreciated. However, they do not represent the views of the CFPB. So let's get started with an introduction of our CAB members. The chair is Bill Bynum. Bill is the CEO of Hope Enterprise Corporation in Jackson, Mississippi. The vice chair is Mava Elise Brown. Mava is the executive director of Housing and Economic Rights Advocates in Oakland, California. Seema Agnani is the director of policy and civic engagement at the National Coalition for Asian Pacific American Community Development in Washington, D.C. Silvia Alvarez is the executive director at the Housing and Education Alliance in Tampa, Florida. Ann Bedore is the director of the Fair Financial Services Program at Texas Appleseed in Austin, Texas. Don Baylor is a senior associate at the Urban Institute in Washington, D.C. Steve Carlson is the co-founder and CEO of Ascend Consumer Finance in San Francisco, California. Tim Chen is the CEO of Nerd Wallet, also in San Francisco, California. Kathleen Engel is a research professor at Suffolk University Law School in Boston, Massachusetts. Judith Fox is a clinical professor of law at the University of Notre Dame in Notre Dame, Indiana. Patricia Garcia Duarte is the president and CEO of Trellis in Phoenix, Arizona. Neil Hall is the executive vice president and head of retail banking at the PNC Financial Services Group in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Dr. Raul Hinojosa Ojeda is an associate professor at UCLA's Division of Social Sciences in Los Angeles, California. Brian Hughes is a senior vice president and general manager of deposits for Discover Financial Services in Deerfield, Illinois. Christopher Kukla is the senior vice president at the Center for Responsible Lending in Durham, North Carolina. 
Max Levchin is the co-founder and CEO of a firm in San Francisco, California. Joanne Needleman is senior counsel at Clark Hills Consumer Financial Services Regulatory and Compliance Group in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Patrick O'Shaughnessy is the president and CEO of Advance America in Spartanburg, South Carolina. The Honorable Annette Rizzo is a retired judge now working with Judicial Arbitration Mediation Services in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Phaedra Robinson is the executive director at the Coalition for Prosperous Mississippi in Richland, Mississippi. Ellen Seidman is a senior fellow at the Urban Institute in Washington, D.C., and a visiting scholar in the Community Development Department at the Federal Reserve Bank of San Francisco. Gene Spencer is the Senior Vice President for Stakeholder Engagement, Policy, and Research for the Homeownership Preservation Foundation in Washington, D.C. Josh Zinner is CEO of the Interfaith Center on Corporate Responsibility in New York City. We also have with us Delicia Hand, Staff Director for the Bureau's Advisory Board and Councils. I'm now pleased to introduce Richard Cordray. Prior to his current role as the CFPB's first director, he led the CFPB's enforcement office. Before that, he served on the front lines of consumer protection as Ohio's attorney general. In this role, he recovered more than $2 billion for Ohio's retirees, investors, and business owners, and took major steps to help protect its consumers from fraudulent foreclosures and financial predators. Before serving as Attorney General, he also served as Ohio State Representative, Ohio Treasurer, and Franklin County Treasurer. Director Cordray. Thank you, Sixta. I, I guess I should get this out of the way up front. For the second straight year as the CAB meeting uh, occurs here in Washington, D.C., I'm sporting a black eye uh, earned in a basketball game back home on Sunday night. Uh, and as I've been representing the Bureau in different settings over the course of the week, it's been closely scrutinized, much like people who gauge the peak of the season when the leaves turn color in the fall. And uh, by my estimate, it's at peak color this morning, so enjoy. Uh, I want to welcome all of you to this meeting of the Consumer Advisory Board, and I hope you don't mind me saying that I really love these gatherings, and, and the members of the CAB know that uh, and see that because I'm uh, often at my most... Um, animated uh, in, in the discussions that we have. The members of the CAB have tremendous expertise and experience and they constantly teach us new things. They also provide diverse perspectives as they relate what they're seeing and hearing about consumers across the country, which as you can guess is very valuable to us. We're all here because we care deeply about how people are being treated in the consumer financial marketplace and the quality of this group leaves nothing of importance unexamined. At the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, we advise all consumers to set goals and make financial plans to meet them. After all, as this is the author of The Little Prince, Antoine de Saint-Exupéry said, a goal without a plan is just a wish. We believe the same should be true for the Bureau itself. If we want markets where good information allows consumers to make smart financial decisions, where consumers can choose among the costs and risks of various financial products, and where good service gives consumers all they can reasonably ask for, then we should first map out how we plan to get there. In 2011, when we first opened our doors, we laid out two strategic objectives, high-level objectives, to guide our work. The first objective was delivering tangible value to consumers, and that has been a compass point, a north star to us uh, throughout our existence. We knew this meant following through on our statutory responsibility to clean up the practices that led to the collapse of the economy and caused so much harm to everyday Americans. It also meant monitoring consumer financial markets so we could see developments as they occur in real time and head off problems that might arise in the future. Many financial regulators have ruefully noted that had they known more about the deteriorating dynamics of the mortgage market and understood better the scope of the damage that could be done, it might have been possible to head off or at least limit the financial crisis that collapsed our economy. With our unique focus on consumer financial protection, we're now in a much better position to conceptualize and assess how these markets are working. The second objective was building a great institution by putting in place the basic infrastructure of this new agency which we built from the ground up, including the personnel and the strategy and the tools, 
necessary to accomplish the purposes that Congress set for us. Those tools include, most notably, supervision, enforcement, rulemaking, research, consumer education, and handling of consumer complaints. By pursuing the goals of even-handed oversight, appropriate law enforcement, fair rules, expert research, and broad-based consumer education and engagement, we have been working to restore trust and confidence to the markets for household financial products and services, the markets that everyday individuals and families uh, are uh, active in around this country. As we do that more and more, we can see that we are succeeding in delivering tangible value for consumers, which, again, was our first objective. Today we continue to move forward with those same two main objectives. Over the past year, we have engaged in an intensive internal effort to prioritize how we use our tools to tackle the most troubling problems facing consumers. We base this new effort around the extent of the consumer harm that we are able to identify, as well as our capacity to eliminate or mitigate that harm. The result is a set of near-term priority goals and a plan for how to deploy our shared cross-bureau resources to achieve these goals. To be clear, these goals do not capture all of the important work we are doing. Far from it. As we approach Steady State as an agency, we have numerous dedicated work streams that are core to our mission. In particular, the Bureau will continue to work, both alone and together with our many partners, to fulfill our mandate under the Dodd-Frank Act to police all markets within our jurisdiction for compliance with consumer financial laws and regulations. Indeed, institutions would be making a mistake if they were to assume that they can let up on their efforts to ensure robust compliance simply because they do not see their particular industry explicitly mentioned among these shared cross-bureau priorities. We set nine of these goals, which represent the key areas where we hope to make substantial progress over the next two years. They are statements we are making about particular outcomes in particular markets that we want to drive toward fulfilling, rather than descriptions of what tools we plan to use. So strategy starts with what we want to see happen in the marketplace, which can then guide us in selecting the tools most appropriate for the task. In the end, we envision markets that perform better for consumers in the following nine ways. First, we envision a mortgage market where lenders serve the entire array of creditworthy borrowers fairly and where servicers have processes in place that result in fair and efficient outcomes for consumers. Second, we envision a student loan market where student loans are serviced in a way that is transparent and fair to help students repay their debts. Third, we envision a consumer reporting market with better data that is more accurate and inclusive of more consumers. Fourth, we envision a market free from discrimination and where consumers have equal access to small business lending. Fifth, we envision a market where consumers are savvy about their own finances and they have reliable places to turn to for the tools and skill building to increase their own financial capability. Sixth, we envision a market where consumer education and policy decisions about household finances are based on a deep understanding of how households use financial products and make choices about money and the effects on their lives. Seventh, we envision an open-use credit market where payday and installment lenders rely on business models that succeed when consumers use credit as needed and are able to repay their debts when they come due. Eighth, we envision a debt collection market where everyone who collects debts substantiates the debts they are collecting and communicates with debtors about their debts in a respectful, lawful, consumer-oriented manner. Ninth, and finally, we envision an entire consumer financial marketplace where consumers will have the ability to effectuate their rights and hold institutions accountable for unlawful conduct. While these goals focus our shared cross-bureau resources and efforts for the future, we continue to dedicate resources so that we can follow through on a few priority work streams that are well established and ongoing, such as our fair lending oversight of indirect auto lenders and our rulemaking on prepaid cards. Today, we will also continue the conversation we have had previously on financial well-being, the ultimate objective, and that will be our second session today, the ultimate objective to which all of our work is intended to contribute. As you recall, last year we published a study defining the concept of financial well-being for consumers. We learned that one's sense of financial well-being is not just about how much money you have in the bank. Instead, it is about having financial security and financial freedom of choice, both in the present and in the future. Following that rigorous research effort, we have now developed and tested a set of questions, a scale, to measure financial well-being. The scale is designed to allow practitioners and researchers to more accurately and consistently quantify something that is not directly observable. The extent to which someone's financial situation and the financial capability they have developed can provide them with economic security and freedom of choice. 
We know that the members of our Consumer Advisory Board have valuable insights to offer on these topics and many more. Indeed, that's why each of them was chosen from among many applicants for these positions. So to conclude, I'm reminded of a business article I recently read about how important the qualities of grit and tenacity and persistence are to successful achievement and how this process requires constant learning and adaptation. All of this rang true to me. Particularly compelling was the passage describing how people in sales who make more sales calls do better than those who make fewer calls, not simply because they obviously have more chances to score a sale, but because the greater effort and more frequent repetitions lead them to gain more insight, develop efficiencies, and make other improvements in the process. In essence, they just have more chances to learn and grow from their increased activity. As we look ahead and work toward the primary goals we've set for ourselves, I believe these are also important characteristics of our work together at the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. We're intent upon constantly and tenaciously pushing forward to make progress on behalf of consumers. We strive to iterate in everything we do, avoiding defensiveness and making improvements that reflect implicit criticism of the partial progress and incompleteness we had made before, in our quest to be better today than yesterday and better tomorrow than today. In maintaining this outlook and approach, we're always seeking to learn, grow, and get better at what we do. So thank you for being here today, and we look forward to a vigorous discussion. Thank you. <clears throat> thank you, Director Cordray, and thank you, Zixta. Um, my name is Bill Bynum, and I want to join um, Director Cordray and Zixta, and on behalf of my colleagues, welcoming all of you to this meeting of the Consumer uh, Advisory Board. We um, take very seriously and appreciate the opportunity to advise the Bureau as it works to protect American consumers. And this morning, information that we'll receive is going to be very instrumental to the work that we will be, will be pursuing. We will hear from the Bureau's Chief of Staff, Chris D'Angelo, who will review the Bureau's near-term goals and priorities. And then he will engage the CAB in a discussion about those priorities. And so with no further ado, Chris, I'll turn the agenda over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Chair Bynum uh, and Vice Chair Brown. And thank you to all the CAB members for having me here to take the opportunity to provide an overview of the Bureau's two-year strategic outlook. I also want to thank Zixta and Delicia and all their staff for the great job that they do in, in setting up these meetings. They're a pretty incredible group. And I want to thank Director Cordray for introducing the topic and his opening remarks. I'll build on the director's remarks in my presentation, first providing a very brief overview of our prioritization and strategic planning process, and then walk through each of our nine priority goals, why we selected those goals, and how we intend to achieve them over the course of the next two years. So just as a reminder, and as the director mentioned in his opening remarks, we started with in 2011 when we opened our doors with two strategic objectives. The first, to deliver tangible value to consumers through data-driven policy and rigorous law enforcement. The second, to build a great institution, one that attracts great talent and is designed to be sustainable and enduring over time. In assessing how we deliver on that first objective, delivering tangible value for consumers, we have focused on four industry-wide problems, which the director first articulated in a 2013 speech to the CAB. Those are, in short order, deception, or situations where the costs and risks of financial decisions are obscured or opaque. Debt traps, or practices that trigger a, a cycle of debt where consumers rack up substantial costs over time. Dead ends, or situations where people cannot vote with their feet when they are treated unfairly, unfairly. A typical example of this is the mortgage servicing market where consumers don't have the opportunity to choose who their servicer is. And discrimination or unequal treatment based on characteristics such as race, gender, and other biases that are prohibited by law. Unfortunately, we find no shortage of these problems in the market and have found it necessary to prioritize how we use our limited resources most effectively. In developing our priority goals over the next two years, we assess these four problems within and across markets and then prioritize them based on the extent of the consumer harm and our capacity to eliminate that harm or mitigate it. The result is a set of nine near-term priority goals where we hope to make substantial progress over the next two years <coughs> and a plan for how we will deploy our cross-bureau tools and shared resources to do so. 
Before I jump directly into the goals, I want to say a few brief things about the process, which internally we named our one bureau planning process. The idea behind that is that we should think across the functional units within the organization and take a step back and look at what we want to accomplish across markets. This was a ground up process where we involved over 200 staff from around the organization. And we designed this process to have four very important features. One, we wanted to shift our way of thinking towards what outcomes we want to achieve in the market as opposed to what specific things we want to do. We wanted to build then a multifaceted or interdisciplinary approach to solving each of those problems or achieving each of those outcomes. We wanted to make sure that that process fed directly into our budgeting process to ensure that our resources are tied to the most critical problems that we're trying to solve as an agency. And we wanted to create a common vocabulary for our staff to ensure that they have the ability to prioritize their own work and create a sustainable working environment for them. One other important thing, as the director mentioned in his remarks, we want to be clear that these goals do not, do not capture the entirety of the important work that's going on at the Bureau. Importantly, we need to maintain our focus on building a strong, sustainable organization. We need to continue to facil facilitate our mandate to police all markets within our jurisdiction for compliance with the consumer financial laws. We need to maintain a robust ability to understand and monitor markets. And we need to continue to intake complaints from consumers, which help us prioritize our work and keep an eye on emerging issues. And now for our nine priority goals, which we've listed in priority, uh, rather in alphabetical order, not priority order. And the other thing to keep in mind, and we'll go through them in detail, for each of these goals, we have not prioritized the entirety of a market, but rather we've specified an outcome or a set of outcomes that we hope to achieve, and then a plan for how we're going to go about doing so. The first of these goals relates to arbitration. In recent years, many contracts for consumer financial products and services have included a pre-dispute arbitration clause stating that either party can require that disputes be resolved through arbitration rather than through the court system. And the CFPB envisions a consumer financial marketplace where consumers have the ability to effectuate their rights and hold institutions accountable for unlawful conduct. We believe this is important because we found in our arbitration study that there's widespread use of pre-dispute arbitration clauses throughout contracts in a variety of products. We found that over 90% of those arbitration agreements expressly prohibit class arbitrations. Moreover, three out of four consumers the CFPB surveyed did not know they were subject to an arbitration clause. The CFPB's arbitration study also found that consumers rarely bring individual lawsuits and that class actions are an effective way to enable large numbers of consumers to secure relief from small dollar claims. We intend to achieve this goal by continuing our rulemaking process and proposing a rule consistent with our study that will further enable consumers to effectuate their rights and hold institutions accountable for unlawful conduct. Our second goal relates to consumer reporting. Consumer reporting companies play a key role in the financial lives of consumers. The reports that the three largest consumer reporting agencies sell are used in determining everything from consumer eligibility to credit, eligibility for employment and housing, even to service members eligibility for required security clearances. The CFPB envisions a consumer reporting system where furnishers provide and consumer reporting companies maintain and distribute data that are accurate and inclusive of more consumers. This problem is important because roughly 26 million consumers lack a credit report, which makes it difficult for those consumers to obtain credit from mainstream lenders. According to an FTC study, roughly 20% of the consumers who participated in their 2012 study had an error in at least one of their credit reports. 5% had errors of a magnitude that could negatively impact their score and result in less favorable loan terms. We will achieve our goal in the consumer reporting market by continuing to examine and investigate consumer reporting companies and furnishers of consumer inf information with a focus on accuracy. We will also use the information we gather to assess options for cooperatively working to improve consumer reporting data. And based on this work, the Bureau may consider rulemaking around furnisher and consumer reporting accuracy, dispute resolution, and related issues. 
The Bureau is exploring how alternative data is or can be used in the consumer reporting system to improve access to financial services. Our third goal relates to debt collection. The CFPB envisions a debt collection market where everyone who collects debt substantiates that debt, accurately identifies debtors, provides debtors with appropriate information, and communicates with debtors about their debts in a respectful, lawful, and consumer-oriented way. We believe that this is important in part because the Bureau receives its highest number of complaints in the debt collection market, around 80,000 per year. And consumers often have limited resources and opportunities to address wrongful collections and practices. We will achieve this goal in part by initiating a rulemaking process with the goal of finalizing a rule that will establish clear rules of the road for debt collectors, both first party debt collectors and third party debt collectors, to ensure that they treat consumers with dignity and respect, obtain and retain information necessary to substantiate the debts they collect on, and provide consumers with appropriate information about their rights. The Bureau's rulemaking activity will be complemented by rigorous supervision and enforcement to ensure that institutions are held accountable for fulfilling their current obligations and eventually by ensuring that institutions comply with any new rules promulgated. Our fourth goal relates to what we call de demand-side consumer activity. This reflects that an essential part of the Consumer Bureau's mission is to empower consumers to take more control over their financial lives and improve their own financial well-being. Here, the CFPB envisions a marketplace where community and public service providers integrate financial capability skill building into their educational and service programs and consumers are aware of and have access to trusted tools and resources to make and act on critical financial decisions. We believe this is important in part because a 2014 survey showed that only half of American families feel that they are financially secure. The amount spent in the United States on financial education of all, of all types is dwarfed by the amount spent on consumer financial marketing. In fact, for every dollar spent on financial education a year, $25 is spent on consumer financial marketing. We will achieve our goal in this space by continuing to create financial decision-making tools, like our paying for college tool, our owning a home tool, and our retire saving for retirement tools, and by ensuring that we build awareness of those tools so that more consumers have access to them. We will provide support to social service providers, youth services, and K-12 organizations to help more consumers build financial skills. We will conduct financial research that financial educators can use to raise the effectiveness of educational and service programs, and some of that you'll hear about later today. Our fifth goal relates to household balance sheets and our research agenda. The lives of American consumers are complex and their financial decisions are implemented by many factors. These decisions sometimes impact their financial well-being for years to come. Current research often yields insights into individual financial choices, but rarely offers a glimpse of the household's entire balance sheet over time. Here, the CFPB envisions policymaking and consumer education based on a deeper understanding of the evolution of household balance sheets and how households use financial products over time. We believe this is important because most current research addresses credit products and financial decisions in isolation without considering the full consumer uh, assets and liabilities. And we believe we'll achieve this goal by initiating a research program aimed at better understanding the factors that promote or inhibit financial health of households by researching the dynamics of household balance sheets. Our sixth goal relates to mortgages. With a market size of approximately $10 trillion, the mortgage market is far and away the largest consumer credit market. For most consumers, a mortgage is a necessary step in the path to home ownership. And here, the CFPB envisions a mortgage market where lenders serve the entire array of creditworthy borrowers fairly and in a non-discriminatory manner. Servicers process result, process, processes result in a fair and efficient outcome for consumers and new mortgage rules are implemented in a manner that supports sustainable, a sustainable mortgage market into the future. We believe this is important 
because even though the mortgage market is far safer and more sustainable today than it was before the financial crisis, a mortgage is still typically the largest debt obligation for many consumers. And half of the consumers who get a mortgage fail to shop for a mortgage in connection with that home purchase, even though it could result in substantial savings. As the market recovers, we believe discrimination remains a significant risk. And at the same time, over 1.5 million consumers are still struggling to pay their mortgages while servicers continue to lack incentives for sufficient investment in customer service and compliance. In addition, we believe investments are needed to ensure the Bureau has the right information to prevent the next crisis and a deep understanding of the mortgage market to support policymaking. Finally, we have an obligation to follow through on implementation of the Bureau's mortgage rules. We intend to achieve this by using our supervisory and enforcement programs to ensure equal and fair, non-discriminatory access to mortgage credit by placing a particular focus on implementation of our servicing rules, protecting delinquent borrowers still suffering in the aftermath of the crisis, ensuring that the new HUMDA rule is successfully implemented so that we have better data to monitor the market, and continuing to work with institutions to support implementation of the rest of the mortgage rules and by beginning to assess their effectiveness over time. Our seventh goal relates to open use credit. The Bureau defines open use credit as any credit product that is offered without an expectation that the loan will be used for a specific pur purpose, such as to buy a home, a car, or to finance higher education. Open use credit may be secured or it may be unsecured, and the open use credit market encompasses a range of financial products, such as credit cards, overdraft products, payday loans, auto title loans, and installment loans. Here, the CFPB envisions an open use credit market where lenders rely on business models that succeed when consumers use credit when they need it and are able to repay their debts when they're due. We believe this is important because we have learned that it is possible for lenders to structure loan products that enable the lenders to succeed even when many of their borrowers cannot afford to repay those loans when they're due. The Bureau has found this to be generally true of payday loans auto title loans, and certain installment loans. In the payday loan space, according to the Bureau's research, over 80% of payday loans are rolled over or followed by another loan within 14 days. And 15% of loans are followed by a loan sequence that lasts at least 10 loans. In addition, low and moderate income households incur large and largely unanticipated costs associated with overdraft products. And most overdraft fees are paid by a very small faction, fraction of bank customers. In particular, 8% of customers incur nearly 75% of all overdraft fees. And the median transaction amount causes an overdraft fee, uh, that, that causes an overdraft fee is just $50. We will achieve this goal by continuing our small dollar rulemaking process with the goal of finalizing a rule that will protect consumers from debt traps associated with unaffordable loans. A proposal to define the larger participants in the installment lending market will also allow the Bureau to supervise a more comprehensive range of lending markets. We will initiate a rulemaking process with the goal of developing rules to make the overdraft market fairer and more transparent. And our supervisory and enforcement work will complement this rulemaking activity. The Bureau's eighth goal relates to small business lending. While most of the Bureau's work focuses on credit markets that serve consumers, Congress also directed the Bureau to monitor certain aspects of the market for small business lending. Small businesses, including those owned by women and minorities, are critical engines for economic growth. And here we envision a small business lending market where fair lending laws are enforced and where communities, government entities, and creditors have access to the data needed to identify the business and community development needs and opportunities for women-owned and minority-owned small businesses. We believe this is important because the small business lending market is vast and complex. With a market size of over $1 trillion, serving over 28 million businesses, Existing research suggests that significant discrimination against minorities may exist in the small business lending market. 
And currently, no federal agency collects comprehensive data on small business loans. We intend to achieve this goal by building a small business lending team to begin market research and outreach for rulemaking on business lending data collection. Subject to an assessment of feasibility, we will build the infrastructure to intake and analyze small business complaints. And as part of our supervisory work, the Bureau will continue to examine small business lenders for compliance with fair lending laws. Our ninth and final near-term priority goal uh, relates to student lending and in particular servicing in the student lending market. The CFPB here envisions a student lending market where services facilitate repayment of student debt in a manner that is consistent with consumer interest, transparent and fair, and provides incentives to encourage these outcomes. We believe this is important because outstanding student debt has nearly doubled since 2007 to roughly $1.2 trillion owed by 40 million consumers. Nearly half of that amount is not currently in repayment, and nearly 8 million student loan borrowers are in default with another 3 million struggling to make payments. Together, that accounts for a quarter of all student loan borrowers. We intend to achieve this goal by continuing our work with the Department of Education and other partner agencies to develop and implement recommendations that align servicer incentives with appropriate consumer outcomes. Through our supervisory and enforcement activity and in coordination with our law enforcement partners, we will hold servicers accountable for their legal obligations to consumers. And based on this work, the Bureau will evaluate possible additional policy responses including potential rulemaking. With that, uh, I'd like to turn the floor over to the CAB for a discussion on the Bureau's strategic outlook for the next two years, and in particular, pose a series of questions for all of you to provide your input on the strategy that we've just discussed. In particular, as the Bureau moves forward in implementing this strategy, how can we engage you, the CAB members, to provide regular progress reports and receive your input over time as we implement this strategy. Maybe. Push to the right button. There we go. I'm so excited about the goals. Um, this is fantastic. Yes, very excited about the goals. Really fantastic can't wait to be engaged on them. Um, what you're working on covers the full range of work within our office. Um, so we hear from consumers all over the state of California about um, every type of matter, except on the small business front, we get that more anecdotally because we're working with so many consumers who do own their small business, one person shops, one woman shops, um, and who are... Uh, who used their home as their piggy bank when they, were, when they had a home and then uh, used uh, all manner of really high-cost products to try to survive. So as far as how you can engage, I would love to get – I would love it if we – perhaps it might be efficient if there were uh, listservs we could sign up for, segmented by topic. Um, uh, listserv might permit you to go ahead and uh, get quick feedback from anybody who chooses to participate – uh, and then periodic updates at your at your convenience uh, on issues of concern. Thank you. That's really helpful, and and we'll take that back and try to see if we can facilitate something like that to ensure that you're getting, especially if there are particular topics that you're interested in, to make sure that there are some sort of regular connectivity on that. Yeah, I'm, I, I would also like to commend the Bureau for this process. Obviously, you put a lot of time and thought into it, and you're covering huge markets. You know, as one example, a debt collection. Um, we had a hotline in New York City for, a, a, for financial justice issues, and the vast majority of those calls for years have been around debt collection, thousands a year. And this is really an industry that has been uh, in a regulatory vacuum for so long, so it's really, really critical uh, that the CFPB is uh, is doing such comprehensive work in looking at that industry uh, and looking at uh, rules that would create a level playing field. Uh, there's one 
and credit reporting as well is is it affects everybody's lives. Five hundred, you know, the big credit bureaus have five hundred million records each, and it affects people in so many ways. Uh, and one point I wanted to make on that, I mentioned this earlier, but I think is worth mentioning in this in this public uh, setting, is uh, I I urge the bureau to look not I I it's really critical that you're looking at accuracy and dispute resolutions uh, to make sure that people's records actually reflect. Um, the truth uh, and that people have a process for correcting them but I also urge you uh, to look carefully at the way that credit reporting companies are marketing this information for uses that have nothing to do with credit uh, especially in the employment context and also in the insurance context uh, over half of employers are using credit history as a as a proxy for character essentially in hiring and other for an other employment related purposes and this really creates a, a catch-22 for lower income people uh, who are struggling with their bills um, and have a real barrier to getting jobs because of that and then because they can't get jobs they can't pay bills and it's and it's really unfortunate also it creates a discriminatory impact on communities that are struggling economically and that have been hit, for example, by a history of predatory lending practices. Uh, in New York City, we passed recently a law that uh, prohibits, it makes it a discriminatory practice for employers to use credit history in hiring. And so uh, I, this, this is a huge, huge problem. Uh, and so I would really urge the Bureau also, as you're studying this market and, and uh, and looking at ways of making this a fair and equitable market that you really look at the way that this, these, uh, this information is being uh, marketed because it can have a really adverse impact on, on people's economic lives. Thank you very much for that. And, and that's absolutely a critical and important issue. Our, our thought process in highlighting accuracy was essentially to ensure we do no harm regardless of how those credit reports are being used, but we'd love to learn more from you and others who have seen some of the uh, similar trends that, uh, that you just described about how that's affecting consumers, and we'll keep that in mind as we continue to tweak and adjust this strategy over time. Thanks. Thanks. I, I, yes, wanna... I was I was also struck by the uh, fact that uh, you the there's great synergy between these priorities one to another. Uh, some of them, though, I do say I think that in terms of engagement, uh, there could be some interrelationship. So, for example, your priorities on small dollar lending and overdraft, uh, just making sure that as you bracket them and kind of think about them, that uh, emphasis on one doesn't kind of stray over to the land of the other. Thank you for that, and that's an excellent point. One of the reasons why we 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 structured the open use credit market the way we did, it's not a term you often see or maybe ever see outside of the Bureau, but we felt like it was important to think about these different products together because sometimes consumers are using them as substitutes, sometimes they have interactions with one another, and so we're being very careful to think about the different processes we have in place and the different work streams we have in place that all touch on each other so that they complement each other and work together. So thank you for that. I apologize for interrupting you before I thought <laughs> you called up both of us. Actually, um, I, I do want to echo that I think these are wonderful priorities. Um, and I guess maybe I'm going to disagree with something you just said. I thought we were, I thought we were saying the same thing. But um, I think it's really important to look at actually how these interrelate um, and so while it's wonderful to set them out as, as sort of discrete areas, um, in my work with low-income folks, you find that, that there's a lot of blurring of these categories. And I guess I'd just give two examples. Um, one of them is, is in the small-dollar loans area. Um, the, you know, the taking out of the loans, the, the, the yeah, deceptive practices, if you want to say, and those kinds of things are important. But one of the really... Um, bad things about these have been the collection practices of them. So by using um, bad check laws, and there have been some agencies that we have uh, dealt with uh, when representing clients who the business model appears to be not so much the amount that the person borrowed, but the fact that by using bad check laws, they can uh, soup them for three times trouble damages and, and 
threaten jail and all those other kinds of things. So, you know, I think it's important to, to remember how closely these different areas intersect and not silo the investigations in that way. And I guess the second example I would use is, is in the student lending area. Um, if you've ever looked at a credit report, it's it's really hard for a consumer to look at a credit report and figure out who they owe, who's in charge, how much they owe. And I think those things hinder someone's ability to, to try to just get a sense of their own financial situation. Thank you for that. And uh, just before, I just want to say th those are excellent points and, and well well taken. And I'm not familiar personally with the student lending piece you talked about, and maybe we can talk about that afterwards. Um, on the small dollar loan piece, the piece the thing I would point out is y while we're engaged in a rulemaking process, both in the debt collection space and in the small dollar lending space, you'll see that many of our enforcement uh, uh, actions and the work that we're doing in that space has actually been looking at the small dollar space and debt collection in particular so that we're, we are thinking about that interaction. So it's an excellent point. And the, if you have ideas for how we can further that, we'd, we'd welcome that input. And then more broadly, one of the reasons why we, um, we, act, we prioritize the household balance sheet research is because we believe that there are a lot of uh, very strong interactions between different financial products and even beyond financial products and how consumers use their money, uh, both assets and liabilities. And so we want to get a deeper understanding of that so that our policy work over time evolves and is attuned to that. So that's all excellent points. Thank you. Yeah. Judge Rizzo and then Fader and I think Patrick. So just to uh, follow up with uh, with Judith's comments, if you look at most of these issues, m other than perchance the balance sheet uh, priority as well as education, all of them are touch points more or less to a court system. So I know I'm sort of on my high horse about that, but there's so much rich data ground up in the state court system where there's all, it's multifaceted. So if you have a... Um, a uh, servicing issue, if you have a debt collection issue, if you have origination of a loan or things such as that, on all sides with all parties to those agreements can be finding themselves named on either side of the ledger in a lawsuit. And I suggest to you that the court system across the board has done a much better job of collecting data on what these lawsuits look like. It's rich with anecdotal information. It's also in terms of shift, understanding laws are varied state to state. But I think we're missing a great opportunity to mine that data and just to see trends at various uh, juncture points of development as it's benchmarked against rulemaking that you would have here in implementation. It's, it, it's, it's the go-to. It's always there and consistently can find this data and analyze, and I think it would be very helpful. So. Very, that's an excellent point as well. And, and you know, one way I hadn't thought about it beyond where we have used that data, which is uh, in our arbitration study, we very much relied on court data for some of the findings there. But beyond that, there's probably a whole wealth of, of uh, information that we can look to in other markets. So that's a great idea. I um, would like to echo what Judy said. In working with low wealth communities, you see a lot of overlap of these issues and excited to see the, the Bureau's approach. Um, to addressing quite a few of these um, and would like to commend you for trying to do it in a way that um, as they morph into other products um, that you still have some oversight and some connectivity to what's going on and can really um, continue to monitor um, the progress of those uh, products with consumers. Um, one of the ways I think that we can continue to be engaged um, as you see emerging trends and um, have reports on what's going on is to maybe look at some video conferencing with um, the CAB um, in order to get some feedback from us and, and allow us to share what we're seeing in the market as well. So I would suggest that in addition to the listserv. Absolutely. We'll, we'll try to do that and we'll work with Delicia and her staff to make sure that happens. Thank you. I think the... Uh, the concept of looking at household balance sheets is extremely important, and uh, and I, it'll be a, a difficult study, but I think it's worthwhile. As you point out, 
most of the time when you look at research, it's it makes an implicit assumption that that research about credit cards or mortgages or whatever is the only source of credit that that person has, and they don't look at them as a holistic view the way consumers actually actually look at them. But I think what you'll find it, it could be interesting that you know money is is fungible and. What you may find, likely, is that it flies in the face of this concept of open-use credit that you talked about before um, in the sense that, you know, again, money is fungible. And when you look at focus groups or talk to consumers, you'll find that the, often f- the fact is that, you know, a, a student who has a student loan, the use of proceeds is not to pay for education, much like people use their house or have used their house as a source of funds for all kinds of purchases other than the purchase of that home. So I think that all credit, when you look at it as a whole, is in effect open use credit. Thank you for the uh, the priority listing of the two separate comments. Um, one, as you delve deep into the family balance sheet and uh, personal financial education, please engage us all in the industry as quickly as you can. One of the things that happens to us as we interact with consumers is we see behaviors that are ill-informed or just completely misguided, and we would love to have a national place to go and say, hey, here's where you go and here's where you study beyond sort of the typically available resources, which require a lot of work on consumers' part. And so having that given to the industry, even before you complete your full research through CAB would be great. Like we certainly, I speak from experience, we try to partner with various financial education charities and frankly found them lacking just either in, they're either very locally focused or they're just insufficiently uh, aware of what what really needs to be done. And then just a very technical comment on the um, open line of credit and or open use credit and probably touches several other topics. One of the things that is fortunately I think happening in, again, in the industry where I, I spend most of my time, we're seeing fairly forceful shift from what I would say sloppy underwriting and sort of covering up the inability to pay with higher rates towards, just through competition alone, towards um, ability and willingness to pay as the fundamental sort of bedrock of the underwriting or credit granting decision, one of the things that impacts the repayment rate, which ultimately drives or encourages credit rates to consumers going down, is facilities to pay or tools to pay. So one of the things that I really encourage the agency to look at, what is available to every demographic, every group of people that you're trying to serve as the actual repayment technology or repayment toolkit. Because between ACH and electronic fund transfers, many other ones, there's a variety of access levels. And depending on where they are, that fundamentally has impact. And it's just not something that gets talked about very often. Uh, thank you. And uh, I do want to commend the Bureau for this uh, list of priorities. It's, a, it's an ambitious list. Um, but I think its ambition underlies the lack of attention paid to consumer protection over time and also underscores the need for the Bureau and the work that you're doing. So this is, I think this is really helpful. Um, there's two pieces that I just want to underscore in here. One is in the mortgage lending piece and talking about ensuring that the entire array of creditworthy borrowers are fairly and in a non-discriminatory manner being, being uh, eligible for credit. Um, I think that's a very important goal. We know that the crisis had a disproportionate impact on low-income communities and communities of color, and those communities are still being left behind in the markets. Uh, and as we as we learned in the putting together the qualified mortgage rules and others, the way in which lenders will um, determine creditworthiness can often leave out uh, groups of borrowers uh, disproportionately um, and, and, if, and impact them in, in negative ways. So I think this is a really important goal, and I'm glad to see this in here. Uh, on the open use credit piece as well, I think one way um, to think about engaging the cab on this is that this is obviously a fast moving and a, and a rapidly changing marketplace, uh, and one that we've spent a lot of time in some of our discussions uh, looking at. 
Um, but what we're also seeing is that there are bits and pieces being pulled from lots of different existing markets and being kind of put together in, in different ways. And so in talking to the cab about these, these issues is remembering that this, there may be, there may be historical precedent to some of the, the, some of the practices that are going on, and we may be able to pull some lessons from different credit markets that are now being put to play in the, in, in this market. Um, so as, you know, for instance, some of these credit uh, credit products are, are morphing into installment type products with balloon you know balloon payments and things like that. We may find that there's there are folks on the cab who have run into those issues in other lending markets. So being able to pull that pull that out and looking at them in a in a wider basis, I think, would be helpful. Thank you. I um, just wanted to let people know that I, you know, obviously there's a lot of interest in and. Um, and insight that we want to share on this issue on, on the agenda, and so we're going to extend the agenda, uh, the, the, the time by a few minutes. So we want to get as many comments as we can. Um, I've got Ellen, then Don, then Patricia, and I'll have a few more after that. Thank you. Um, I also think that this is a wonderful list of of um, priorities, and and also reemphasizing the four Ds as the basis for all of it. Um, I want to talk a little bit about the um, con the demand side consumer behavior one. Um, first of all, uh, in terms of spending on financial education, uh, the financial services industry is by far the biggest spender. And figuring out how the Bureau can better interact with the financial services industry so that that spending actually becomes more effective uh, could make an enormous difference. Um, and I think that the tool that we'll be discussing this afternoon uh, may be a very useful way of helping the financial services industry do what I believe they want to do, which is have effective financial education. So by providing a, a really useful um, measure. So that goes then to, to something else, which is I, I think the Bureau's um, focus on financial health and well-being as the ultimate outcome might actually be um, slipped into this goal usefully so that you've got um, an ultimate impact as in, in, uh, beyond the, the techniques. And then finally, while um, it might be possible to include um, in community and public service providers uh, entities like community colleges and hospitals, um, they don't come to mind uh, with these terms uh, quickly, and yet they are absolutely critical places where the kind of financial capability uh, work can be done and um, can be extremely effective in making a difference in people's lives. Thank you. So I uh, wanted to turn, my atten uh, turn our attention to the open use credit uh, once again. and probably more specifically in the payday and auto title loan space. Um, so two points here. I think it is important for the Bureau, you know, understanding that this is a very complicated rulemaking process in terms of um, how these products morph, um, also kind of the overlay of state laws and regulations, et cetera. But um, I do believe it is important uh, for the Bureau to set specific numeric goals uh, in terms of consumer outcomes in the space. And so almost thinking about what does success look like uh, when we aggregate the consumer uh, experience. Um, and I think the second uh, the second point is, um, which I think is kind of hard, I think, I think it's, it is important for the Bureau to be prepared to, um, to adjust this rule after, it's, after it goes into effect, um, once looking at how the marketplace does react um, given how complicated the space is, there may be a need to kind of come back and adjust the rule if if it's really not having the impact uh, that it was intended to have. Uh, first of all, um, I want to congratulate uh, the CFPB for all the work that has been done, especially in the mortgage space. That's the area that I navigate the most. And um, I love all the, the nine uh, new goals, so thank you for that. One thing that I'd like to encourage more work on, and we all can help in this space, is letting 
more people know that the CFPB exists. The website has wonderful tools, and unfortunately, many times buyers are just relying on the industry people. And the industry people are the very same people. They are always complaining because of all these changes. Unfortunately, the messaging that we got here for a real reason, um, a very important reason that we should not forget, that's left out. People just hear um, the delays are happening because of the new rules, but there's a big story that is missing there. So in as much as we can help more people understand, there's a new bureau. A lot of folks may not know what the role is. For the very first time, we have this bureau that is watching out for consumers' protection on financial products and services. That is huge, but I think America still needs to learn that piece. So uh, again, uh, one last thing around servicing. Um, HAMP restructured the whole process. The fact that it's going to be going away, this HAMP uh, product is going to be going away, and the uncertainty of how servicers are going to behave in the future is also a, a really important issue that we need to put our arms around it. Thank you. Kathleen and Steve, Raul, Joanne, Brian, Tim. So a lot of opinions and thoughts here. <laughs> <laughs> I think following up on Patricia, maybe we should all have uh, T-shirts that say, what is the CFPB? You could just <laughs> give them out at sporting events, and it could, it could uh, help to inform people. Um, so I have a couple of thoughts about that sort of fall into the category of mortgages, market um, monitoring, and uh, servicing. And um, as you are, you know, looking at um, sort of deeper dives into these uh, mortgage products, which I think a modification is, um, just want to encourage you to slice and dice a bit more. Um, and that can be, you know, geographic variations to learn about where loans are being made and what kinds of loans, um, who the people are who are getting loans, so different sort of subgroups and, and, uh, and the like. Um, and in particular, looking at default rates by servicer um, and geographically to see whether um, uh, what it can give us some insights about servicing. And I feel that particularly strongly around um, the loan mods what we're seeing with the loan mods. And I also um, want to encourage looking closely at the quality of the loan modifications um, to ensure compliance with HAMP and with your own UDAP authority. I'm not sure what you do with that extra A in there, but um, it seems like that these are important things. Even though HAMP is winding up, those, those loan mods are still out there, and I think there, there's some problems. Um, and um, and similarly, in terms of your your marketing, I mean monitoring of the markets, um, looking for steering that we might not expect um, to observe to to see if it's out there. And in particular, I'm concerned about people of color being steered to FHA loans who would be eligible for conforming loans. So that maybe other people have ideas about sort of patterns that that. That may be occurring. I don't know it. It's just a, a sense from what some data I've looked at. Um, in terms of student loans, um, there's just a paucity of data on student loans. Well, actually, there is a ton of data on student loans, and it's at the Department of Education. And it makes it very difficult to look at important questions like what is the impact of servicing on loan pr on, on default and delinquency rates? So given how well the Bureau has partnered with other agencies um, in ways I think that didn't used to happen so much in the government, um, I hope that you will be able to um, work with the Department of Education and get the NSLDS data if you don't already, or at least to get the reports so you can do analysis. Um, and then the last thing has to, uh, last point I want to make is um, about the about debt collection. Um, one, this is one of those places where you know the federal government or an agency can do a fabulous job, but there are problems happening in the state law arena that make it difficult. So, for example, some states have garnishment laws that date back to the 50s and 60s. So, if the state law says you can sweep this bank account just as long as you leave 75 dollars a week in it. 
um, for living expenses, <laughs> that's a problem. So what you know, what you do, sort of um, really can can be hampered by these state laws. And I don't know the extent to which you can really, given how much is on your agenda, work with state legislatures. Maybe some way of working with the National Association of Attorneys General or some organization to help states to identify. Um, some ways in which their garnishment rules could impede the effectiveness of your efforts to protect people against um, unfair debt collection. And the last thing I want to say is this is this this memo that you gave us, your ideas, everything are it's so clear and so comprehensive and ambitious. And given everything you've done, I think it's definitely achievable. So thank you very much. <laughs> Steve. Thanks. Um, I was, you know, excited to see under consumer reporting that you're flagging the use of alternative data as one of the areas that you want to be look, uh, looking at. Um, I think it's pretty clear that from uh, an industry perspective, we've been looking for some guidelines in regards to how uh, the regulators are thinking about alternative data. And I think it's really important, though, as you go into this, to think about this as you know, there's clearly a need to protect consumers from the harm, but there's also very many benefits that will come out of the uses of alternative data that I think we're starting to see, um, you know, including expansion uh, to uh, access of credit, uh, real-time ability to pay. And so as you, uh, as you embark on this, you should acknowledge explicitly, assuming this is what the Bureau believes, that there are potential for uh, positive outcomes from the use of such credit. Um, I just think that that will be setting the right tone uh, in the industry uh, as you are starting to look at these things and move forward. In regards to uh, that specific area, I think the members of the CAP can help you significantly. You know, there's many of us who are uh, deeply involved in either using the data or um, with folks who are using. And this is going to move outside of the traditional big three players uh, that you do uh, oversee and regulate. So we can help you understand who we're talking to, what we're seeing, how it's being used, et cetera. We will undoubtedly take you up on that offer. And when when you look at the more detailed document, which it will be on our website later today, the way in which we talk about al alternative data is very much in that balanced way of understanding that there are potential risks, but that there's cr tremendous opportunity for access. We don't know all of the information we need to know to know where that balance is struck. And so that's what we're going to be thinking about and exploring over the course of the next months and years. So thank you. Um, Raul? Yes, hi. Um, and I, I also uh, w want to um, uh, um, say that this is quite an ambitious agenda, and I, and I really think that the um, CFPB is doing not only a great job in laying this out, but also, frankly, I just also want to say, having brought together this advisory board of which I, I've just joined is really quite a an interesting um, group of uh, representatives from the industries, from the uh, advocate and research communities, and that I think is really doing a tremendous uh, job at, at, at trying to tackle what is obviously a very large um, uh, issue and that's been um, neglected for a long time. Um, um, and I and I specifically I was going through the. The, the points, uh, and and I, I brought this up earlier. I I think one of the issues we have to focus on is also the expansion of access and questions of financial inclusion. And and I, I can see that in many uh, uh, points throughout here, there are there is these these uh, uh, um, ways that you can point out that there are indeed a lot of people that are still left out of the system that are but are probably. Um, reflected in, in some in the way in which the goals are obviously the 26 million um, consumers that lack credit reports. I mean, many people don't have any way of getting a credit report because they don't even have bank accounts and ways in which that there's a tracking mechanisms for uh, for payments, for example. That um, there are uh, other ways that uh, the the ways that we can also focus on the needs of the the half of the American families that feel. Uh, that they are financially insecure. Uh, many of them are precisely because they're they're paying the highest cost uh, for their basic financial services because they are completely dependent on an alternative financial industry, which is again doing a 
a great job in terms of being out in the communities, but that there are ways in which I think we need to focus on on how to help people uh, transition uh, to other types of products. So I, I would just um, uh, um, recommend that we, when we do our data work as and as we tr implement these, that we begin to, to try to highlight the, the question of financial inclusion and how are we bringing more people uh, in to be able to use platforms, products, the use of data, for example, uh, that a lot of people have but that are not necessarily in the financial system that could be used as a way to get them into a, a, a better uh, uh, standing. And, and definitely, um, I mean, there is data that is being generated in a variety of, of settings, university settings, et cetera, that I think may be useful and that we do set up some also some goals and metrics for how we're going to be able to address this question of, of the of the um, broadening the inclusion, especially at this moment when there's economic recovery. Thank you. I'm going to unfortunately need to bring us to a close in about four minutes. And so as I call on our next five, <laughs> I'd ask that you keep seconds. that in mind. Um, so right. Joanne. I think I have 40 seconds, so I'll be really quick. Um, I think this is, you know, this is great. I, I, what I what I really like about it, especially as it deals with the specific markets, I think it gives those markets a sense of what they need to be doing in the next couple of years, just from a very 10,000 foot level, and that is really helpful because I think a lot of markets have struggled as to what is it that the CFPB really wants. So I, I do appreciate it. Um, I was going to make a point about debt collection, but a lot of people have made the point already. But I will say about. Um, Consumer education and knowledge and, 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 and financial literacy and everything that you want to do to help consumers empower their lives, which is the mission of the Bureau, knowledge is power. And I think for a lot of consumers, it's not so much knowing it's how to engage with the financial services industry. I think much like they're afraid to engage in the court system, you know, they, they see companies or big banks as something that are completely unattainable. So helping consumers understand not only to gain the knowledge, but to use it the right way to assist them, I think should be really important. Thank you. All right, um, Brian and Raul, could you turn your, everyone turn the mic off after they're finished. Thank you. All right, thank you, Bill. Um, just two quick comments. One is, I like how the categories are defined as markets because you can include comprehensively then the relevant products um, and then also the relevant players. As we've all seen an explosion uh, in financial technology and all the new innovators ensuring that you know, all the players are um, under the regulation that consumers know where to go to get protection regardless of, of who they're dealing with in the market, regardless of sort of charter or status or, or what have you. And, and I think it's a good way of getting the benefit of, of all the financial innovation that's going on while still giving consumers a protection. I think hopefully the, the market construct helps you do that. Uh, and then secondly, um, as, you, as you look at within the markets, um, the protection of consumer financial information is something that when we do research, we see consumers uh, are often articulating as their number one need, uh, the fear of identity theft and, and, the, and the unauthorized use of their information. And so I think that is an element of consumer protection that can hopefully make its way into the, the various uh, actions you take in these, in these different markets. M, Sylvia, and then Seema. Uh, hey there, uh, it's it's Tim from NerdWallet. Uh, great in, great initiative. I realize it's really hard mobilizing hundreds of people or over a thousand people and aligning them around an objective. So I think this is a great way to go. Uh, I guess uh, my my thought during the uh, consumer demand part was, uh, you know, please lean on private industry that's uh, struggling with the exact same uh, problems. Uh, I'll I'll pick on car insurance a bit. Um, in the UK, uh, there's a lot of shopping behavior for car insurance. Uh, in the US, uh, a lot of folks in our industry have tried and utterly failed. Google just pulled out of the market this week. Um, and I would say uh, it's kind of, uh, there, there's a set of problems we face in terms of uh, the top couple of uh, participants having such disproportionate uh, marketing spend. And US consumers are often reactive and not proactive. They spend a lot of time watching television. Um, if you spend a billion dollars a year on TV ads, you're going to outperform the CFPB in awareness. And so there's a, a lot of issues like that that um, I think you can really leverage uh, private industry innovators in, in terms of understanding. 
And uh, I, too, would like to commend the Bureau, and I'm going to keep my, my, my talk real short, but not just for the nine uh, priorities, but also for how quickly you have achieved results, something that has never been my experience with government. So thank you so much for that. Um, you spoke to my heart with these priorities. The credit reporting issue is a problem. It's one of the biggest problems that we face working with our clients. And I'm glad to know that that is a focus. Also, financial education, uh, I'll cut it short. It's one of the best ways to ensure that we never see a crisis like this again. And uh, in mortgages, if you could focus on a way that we can get lenders to do loans under $50,000. There's a huge segment of this country that still needs those loans, and lenders don't want to do them because it's not as profitable as making larger loans, but we have to help the lower income people. So um, that's it. Thank you, just quickly. Um, so um, I was really excited to see uh, financial capability and sort of looking at household budgets um, on the priority list. I think it's great that you're looking long term um, as well as sort of credit. Um, one thing I wanted to just highlight is, you know, that there is great diversity when you look within low income communities and you look at household budgets in terms of sources of income and what are the barriers. Um, to growing assets and things like that. So um, in as much as we can be helpful in scanning the field and supplying uh, examples, would love to be able to do that um, so that we can really um, get to the, the unique positions that different communities are facing. I'll take the chair's privilege and um, just make a couple of comments. Um, as a the head of a financial institution that works in a very high poverty area, I really appreciate the overlay of uh, deception, debt traps, dead ends, and discrimination. Um, these are all too common in many parts of the country in the Deep South. And, and so I think it's really important. I think this board can help to make sure that um, in addition to the incredible resources that are available within the Beltway, that there are networks and information and uh, data available through um, organizations, particularly uh, nonprofit organizations that are more likely going to be engaged in advocacy around uh, protections against these issues. Uh, there, particularly, and even the financial sector, the community development financial institutions um, within credit unions. I had the opportunity to speak. Um, with a group of credit unions, and many credit unions um, do continue to have a focus on filling those gaps. Not all, but many do, particularly low-income credit unions, community development credit unions, uh, and, and there's also associations of micro lenders. And I, I think the Bureau has done a great job of engaging with a broad uh, range of stakeholders, and I just want to encourage you to continue and to reach uh, deep and within those um, trade groups and those uh, types of service providers, even nonprofit service providers that uh, may not be as readily heard here in Washington. So, but again, I, I concur with my colleagues. I think this is an impressive uh, agenda. We uh, stand ready to be helpful in, when it, in any way we can. Thank you for sharing with us. And, th and thank, all, thank all of you, too. This was really helpful feedback, and I uh, look forward to engaging in more conversations with all of you as well. Thank you. We will now break and reconvene at 2 o'clock. Thank you. <laughs>